Thank you very much, um, Leslie, for reading that to us. Um, now, I'm actually going to preach on the whole of chapter nine, and we've only had the first half, because it's a very long reading. Um, I'm tempted to read a bit more of it, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what's going on. But can I encourage you, maybe especially today, to look in the Bibles that are in the pews and have them open in front of you, because we haven't looked at the whole passage. It's um, on page 1075 and 1076, I think, in the Bibles, John chapter 9. Um, and we'll be looking and, and think following more about that. Let's pray, though. Um, we need God's word. We need God's help. So let's pray for that help. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. We thank you that it's a word that speaks powerfully today. It's a word that um, enlightens us and shows us the truth. Help us to have humility and courage as we come to look at it, to see what you want to say. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I, I wonder if you, um, it's been the party political conference season. Are you all fans of the party political conferences? No. Okay. Well, they, they can be sort of um, interesting, um, but there's often quite a lot of insults thrown around, isn't there? I don't know if you picked up this, um, this year a couple of key insults that were quite famous. Um, so, um, Angela Rayner, the deputy leader of the um, Labour Party, um, famously um, was actually sort of told off or in trouble for um, calling all of Boris Johnson's cabinet, cabinet um, scum. <laughs> did, you, did you come across that? Um, so a bit of an insult going on there. I mean, I, mean, I remember Tory scum being called, used quite a lot in the past by socialists, but there you go. Um, and, but then Boris Johnson, who is maybe a bit more articulate with his insults, um, said this about um, Sir Keir Starmer, that's his name, <laughs> the leader of the Labour Party. Um, he said this, a seriously rattled bus conductor. So, yes, more articulate, but basically it's an insult, isn't it? I don't know you feel that um, our politics often does um, fall into insults. Um, one party slagging another party off, one leader slagging another leader off. And you can think, well, are we really getting to the debate, the real debate that's going on? Are we really understanding the issues and, and what needs to happen to, to make our country a better country? Well, actually, as, as you read for this passage, um, we didn't quite get to the real insults, but there's, there's insults going on in this passage. There becomes a bit of a slanging match. So, I don't know if you notice, um, in the last, one of the last verses there, um, they, the Pharisees say to the, the blind man, or the formerly blind man, that Jesus was a sinner. That was an insult. He's, he's a wicked person. He's a bad person. He's scum. Um, you shouldn't have anything to do with him. And when the blind man disagrees with them, a bit later on, this is where you need your Bible, you might want to turn to verse 34. On, um, when they've, he's, he's given a good argument that Jesus is the Son of God, he is from God. How do they respond? They say, um, you were steeped in sin at birth. What a challenge, I was that, that, do, well, how do you feel if people said that to you? You're steeped in sin at birth, you've been so wicked right from the beginning. Um, it's sort of come into this kind of slanging match here. And, and yet, actually, what's going on in this passage, um, it's a passage about a healing. There's only actually three healings in John's Gospel that are recorded. Do you realize that? Um, this is one of them. We looked at another one two weeks ago. Um, but actually, the healing part is only in a few verses, isn't it? Most of this is a discussion. It's a debate. It's an argument going on, mainly between the Pharisees and the blind man. And that, that's quite strange as well, because mostly in John's Gospel, it's a debate between Jesus and the authorities, or Jesus and someone else. Here it's the blind man who's doing the debating. But it's more than a slanging match. Now, this idea of a sinner is actually goes right back to the beginning of the passage. So Jesus is wandering around with his disciples in Jerusalem. It's a festival again. Um, and they see this blind man. They find out they've been blind from birth. Uh, and so the disciples have a question. And they say in verse 2, um, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you see the assumption there? This man is suffering because he's a sinner. Now, there is truth in that, isn't there? Often, sin can be connected with suffering. So if you have an affair, you may end up having your marriage fall apart. Your sin creates suffering. If you rob a bank, you may end up in jail. Your sin creates suffering. Um, if you drink heavily, you may end up dying early from liver failure. Your sin creates suffering. There is a connection between sin and suffering. And, and sometimes suffering does happen because of sin. And yet what's happening here is they're assuming that any suffering 
is a result of sin. But actually, if you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is clear that's not always the case. And Jesus here is clear that that's not always the case. In, in this case, he says, this, this man's not suffering. He's not blind because he sinned. He's not blind because his parents sinned. No, God's got another reason for this man's suffering. And when we see suffering around, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about why that suffering's happened. And Jesus says, actually, this man is suffering so that the works of God can be seen in him. Sometimes God allows us to go through periods of suffering and difficulty because actually God can use that to bring us to him, to show us the truth about him. And the blessings we gain from that are far greater than any suffering we might find in life. And as we shall see, this, this man who was born blind ends up having far more insights, far more depth of knowledge and understanding of who God is and what God has done for him in Jesus Christ than all the religious clever leaders put together. Who sinned? And Jesus says at the end this. Um, you might see this in verse 39. He says, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. The Pharisees accused Jesus of being a sinner. They accused a blind man of being a sinner. The disciples said um, that his parents, maybe, maybe his parents are sinners because he's blind, or he's a sinner because he's blind. But Jesus says, no. Actually, you want to see who the real sinners are? Look at how people respond to me. Look at people, how people react to the works of God that I'm doing around. Those that reject the truth about me, their blindness is a sign of real sin. And at the end, um, some Pharisees say to him after he said this, um, what, are we blind too? And Jesus says, well, if you think you're not blind, then you're still guilty of sin. If you're rejecting the truth about Jesus, despite what you've seen of doing in these amazing signs, healing a man born from birth, blind from birth, then your sin is even greater. And actually the heart of sin it's not doing particularly bad things wrong. The heart of sin is rejecting God and rejecting truth about God. And from that comes darkness in our hearts and from that comes the, the wicked things that people do. So there's a question here, who sinned? This is more than a slanging match. This is something in depth. Not sure what's happening there. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So what has helped the blind man see? Well, Jesus has made him see in reality, but what is keeping some people spiritually blind and some people actually coming to see things? And I want to look at the attitudes of the Pharisees and the attitudes of the blind man. Um, hopefully, Rosa, can you try and push this on? I'm not sure what's happened with the words. Something always goes wrong with the technology every week, doesn't it? So, <laughs> there's always something. So what are the causes of spiritual blindness? Well, I want to say there's two causes that are shown in this passage. Firstly, there's fear, and secondly, there's pride or arrogance. Let's look at the fear. Um, the fear is to do with, we see particularly with the man's parents. It's a bit odd, isn't it, that the parents are brought in. You know, the Pharisees have got the blind man there. Um, he, he says, like, I was born blind from birth, but now I can see, and they want to check that this is true. They want to work out this is really happening, so they don't really want to accept that Jesus could have done that. So they bring the parents in, and they say to the parents, is this your son? Was he really born blind? And if so, why, is he, why can he now see? And the parents, um, they're really cautious, aren't they? They say, um, well, yeah, yeah, he's, he's our son, yes, and, and, he, and he was born blind, but, but we've no idea why he can see now. Ask him. Don't, don't, don't bother us. Ask him. He's, he's old enough to tell you. Why are they like that? Why, why are they so um, uneasy about exploring what this healing means? Well, John tells us. In verse 22, he said, His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledges that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. To be put out of the synagogue, I mean, now you might think that not being allowed to come to church wouldn't affect your life that much. Um, 
Some of you would feel that it would do, others might maybe, nah. But actually, for these people in that society, it was everything. To be put out of the synagogue would mean being ostracized from your families, your friends, your neighbors. It would be a terrible situation to be in. And the parents were afraid of that. We don't want to be ostracized. We don't want to be put out by people. We don't want to be feel, feel people's insults and, and threats. We, we're afraid of those things. We want to avoid those things. And so they avoid exploring the truth. They avoid thinking through what's happened to their son and what it means about Jesus. And, and as a vicar, you, you come across people who can be initially quite interested in the Christian faith, but when they begin to see that becoming a Christian might mean that others might reject them or insult them, when it might mean that they, they'll be cut off from family or friends in some way, then they withdraw and give up their search. You may have seen that with people that you know as well. Actually, fear is something that can prevent people exploring the truth. It can prevent people seeing the truth. Fear of what people might do to you can create spiritual blindness. Are you afraid of really finding out who Jesus is? Are you afraid of really being known to belong to him? Is that leading you into some kind of spiritual darkness? But the other cause of spiritual blindness is pride or arrogance. And we see this particularly with the Pharisees. Um, firstly, the Pharisees are judging Jesus as a sinner. Why? Because he's doing healings on the Sabbath. Um, and, and actually, although there is one of, the, one of the Ten Commandments is a law not to do any work on the Sabbath, and it is right that we, we follow that, actually what the Pharisees had done was create a whole load of um, worked out human rules um, explaining exactly what that meant. And there are all sorts of rules about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus had challenged them about that and had said, look, actually, your human rules, your human regulations about the Sabbath um, aren't correct. You say that I can't heal people on the Sabbath, and yet you also say, and this is true back in chapter 7, verse 23, he says, if a boy, if a, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, so the law was that you circumcise the baby on the, when they're eight days old. If that happened to be on the Sabbath, you still had to do that. That was more important than obeying the Sabbath. If you can do that, he says... Why are you angry for me for healing a whole man's body on the Sabbath? Jesus says that actually your human arguments don't really work. They don't really fit with the thrust of what the Bible is saying. And yet you judge me by your human standards. And again, do, have we worked out our own human standards, our own human way of thinking, our own decisions about what we think is right or wrong? And do we then just dismiss people that break our rules? as being wicked or wrong. We see quite a lot of less in the world today, don't we? There's all sorts of rules and ways of thinking, and if you go against what certain groups think, people think, they just sort of say, you should be out, you should be kicked out. Because they're breaking human ways of thinking. There's a pride, there's an arrogance in that. And secondly, actually, the way the, the Pharisees speak in this chapter, they say, look, we know he's a sinner. Do they really know? How can they be so confident that they got this worked out right? Isn't it their arrogance, their pride again that gives them that confidence? And isn't it misplaced? And then when the, what they say to the blind man back in verse 34, they say, you were steeped in sin at birth, but how dare you lecture us? They're not responding with an argument to show why he's wrong. They're not debating with him properly. They've gone to insults, and their insults are trying to sort of say, look, we're important, we're clever, you're stupid and idiotic. No, we've we spent our lives studying God's words, studying scripture. You've just been a blind beggar doing nothing. How can you lecture us? Do you hear the arrogance behind that? And yet in their arrogance and pride, this blind man who's had seen nothing in the whole of his life is seeing more deeply, more powerfully about Jesus than they ever could. Their pride is making them blind. And again, 
Is your pride getting in the way of seeing who Jesus really is? Are you too unwilling to admit that you might get some things wrong? Are you too quick to turn to insults when you can't think of an argument or someone seems to be proving you wrong? Are you too quick to dismiss people that disagree with you? Is that preventing you seeing the truth? Fear and pride, these are great enemies of spiritual insight. They lead to darkness and to blindness. And yet, the blind man who is healed, he shows the exact opposite of these things. Rather than spiritual blindness, he comes to true spiritual insight. And why? Well, actually, I think his qualities are the opposite. Rather than fear, he has courage. Rather than pride, he has humility. Let's have a look at those two things. So firstly, um, humility. And I think we see this clearly from the um, first part, actually when he's healed, what Jesus does to him. Because what does Jesus do to him? Um, Jesus spits on the ground, turns it into mud, and then puts it on his eyes. Now, we're at a stage where we're maybe getting a bit more relaxed about regulations from COVID, but, we, you know, some of us are still wearing masks, some of us are trying to keep away from each other. I'm sure none of us would like someone to spit and put it on our eyes. Some people are sort of wincing at the thought. <laughs> so he's let Jesus do that to him, and that's, that's a bit strange in itself. But then, more importantly, he says to the man, right, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Now, he's basically saying to him, look, go across a busy city, walking, you can't see, walking blind, find your way to this other pool, um, and then wash your, wash your eyes, and then you'll see. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone told me to do that, I'd think, what? <laughs> what ridiculous. Why should I do that? And, and why is Jesus doing that here? I mean, Jesus can just sort of snap his fingers and someone's healed, or say the word and it's, he's healed. Why is he telling the man to do this? And yet it's in a way, it's, it's a way of the man taking the first step of faith because this man's got to go this difficult journey with his eyes covered in his muds, trusting that Jesus' word is true, trusting that Jesus is right, no matter how ridiculous he might think this is. And that takes humility, doesn't it? There's a story in the Old Testament of a guy called Naaman. Have you heard of Naaman? He was a, he was a, a general in the Syrian army very successful, um, top person, and um, he got leprosy, horrible skin disease. But he heard that in, in Israel was a prophet, Elisha, and, and the prophet could heal people. So he went to Elisha, hoping he'd heal him. But before he got to Elisha, Elisha knew he was coming and sent someone out to him and said to him, go to the Jordan and wash seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman was offended. I'm an important general. I'm a top dog. I'm like the defense secretary of Syria. How can this prophet of Israel not even bother to come and see me? Why can't he come out and sort of wave his hands over me or something and say something, say some prayers and, and get me healed that way? What, why is he telling me to go to the River Jordan, that stupid Israelite river? Why can't I wash, wash in the river back in Syria, a decent river? And he was offended because it hit his pride. And because of his pride, he wasn't going to do what um, Elisha had said to him, but his servants persuaded him. You know, it's very easy, just go and do it. So in the end, he did accept Elisha's words. He humbled himself and went to the River Jordan. He washed seven times, and he was healed. Naaman learned humility in the face of God's words. This blind man learns humility in the face of Jesus' words. And he finds sight, literally finds sight, but actually finds true insight as well, true spiritual insight. And that develops over the story as, as the man grows in courage. So as you go through the story, you see how his understanding of what, who Jesus is grows because of his courage. So when he goes home, he's, um, he gets home and the people around him start saying, well, Wait a minute, are you the guy that was begging? But you can see now. And other people say, no, you can't be the guy. He just looks a bit like him. Now, there was a debate amongst the people of his neighbours. And 
And the man at this point could have stayed really quiet. He could have sort of kept a low profile. Now, some people like to keep a low profile, don't they? They don't, they don't want to be sort of seen because it's sort of scary to be in front of people in some way. I know when we're doing recordings for the um, online services, some people were too scared to, to be recorded and be seen um, online. That doesn't matter too much, but, but actually that, there's a courage in being in the limelight. And yet this man does stand up and say, no, I am the man who is blind. This, a real miracle has happened. And so he draws attention to himself. But at this stage he just says, it was the man called Jesus. He just accepts that Jesus is some kind of healer and has healed him. This is the first step in faith, but it comes with his courage. And then they drag him to the Pharisees who want to do an inquiry into what's happened. And then the Pharisees start debating, don't they, about whether Jesus is a sinner because he's done this on a Sabbath or whether he can't be a sinner because he's doing these amazing miracles. Um, and then they turn to the man and they, and they say to the man, um, what, have you, what, what have you to say about him? This is verse 17. It was your eyes he opened. And the man says, he is a prophet. Now, as having heard the debate of the Pharisees and reflecting what's actually happened to him, he realizes that Jesus must be a person from God. Maybe someone like Elisha, maybe more, but he's beginning to, his face beginning to grow, and he's willing to say that, isn't he? He's not worried about what the Pharisees might do to him, like, unlike his parents. Unlike the, the disabled man. Do you remember two weeks ago, the disabled man, when he was healed? He basically sort of turned Jesus in because he didn't want to be in trouble with the authorities. But now this man is willing to say, no, he is a prophet. I know that's a controversial thing to say, but I'm going to stand up to say it. Jesus is from God. He has courage, and in his courage, he's coming to a deeper insight, a deeper understanding. And then after talking to his parents, they bring him back again, and they say, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Um, and he says, actually, I don't know if he's a sinner. Actually, this man's got humility, as I said. He's not willing to sort of say what he does know or doesn't know. He's willing to admit he doesn't know everything. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then he says um, in verse 28, when they're hurling even more insults at him, when the pressure's on, um, he says, sorry, verse 27, he says, do you want to become his disciples too? In other words, he's saying actually now, I'm Jesus' disciple. I believe he's a prophet, but more than that, I want to follow him. I want to hear what he says. I want to follow his teachings and listen to him. He's seen that following Jesus is the way to go. He's a disciple to go, and he's got the courage to stand up and say, look, I am a follower of Jesus. Even in the face of great pressure um, from the, and insults from the Pharisees. And then finally, having been kicked out of the synagogue, Jesus finds him. And Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, tell me who he is. And Jesus says, You're, you, you can see him now. In reference to the fact he has sight. Not just the sight to see physically, but spiritual insight. And how does the man respond? He says he worships Jesus. This is the only man in John's Gospel to worship Jesus before he dies on the cross and is raised again. This man can see beyond what anyone else has seen. Because in his courage, he is willing to pursue and stand up for the truth. The truth as he understands it. The truth of, as he grows to understand it because of what Jesus has done to him. The sign of healing him from his blindness. In a way, this blind man is like an ideal disciple. You want to know what following Jesus looks like? He is someone to follow. It means having humility, accepting that sometimes we haven't got it. We get things wrong. We need to listen to what Jesus says to us. We need to follow him even when it seems strange and weird. But also courage. Courage to stand up for the truth. Courage to be known as a follower of Jesus. Courage to worship him truly. There's a bit in the passage where the, disciple, where the Pharisees say to the man, um, this is in verse 24, give glory to God by telling the truth. It's a way of sort of saying, you know, swear an oath on the Bible, tell the truth. But actually for John, I think there's, a, there's an irony here, irony here. 
Because in the man, the man in disagreeing with the Pharisees, what does he do? He truly does give glory to God. He truly points out who Jesus is. In his humility and his courage, he has the insights but shares it with others. As disciples of Jesus, we, like this man, are sent. It's interesting, John points out the name of Siloam means sent. Actually, in the Greek, the word is apostole, from which we get the word apostle. We're called to be apostles. We're called to be sent, like this man, to witness to the glory of Jesus, to tell others what he's done in our lives. Sometimes people say to me, I'm too scared to talk about my faith because I'm worried that people will um, argue against me and I won't have the answers. This man knew almost nothing. He accepted when he didn't understand things. But he spoke about what Jesus had done in his life. And his faith grew. And his witness was powerful. Let's follow his example. Let's have humility and courage to trust in Jesus, to follow him, and to be sent by him into every area of our lives to be his witnesses, his apostles. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of this blind man, and we pray that you would um, help us, like him, to have courage and humility, to follow you, to pursue the truth, and to give glory to your name. Amen.